<laughs> I don't know if you guys can even see me. But hey, that's all I got right there. But I'm going to, I got to go, I got to head outside right now to check how the battery's doing. Windy. <laughs> it's pretty cool though, isn't it? <laughs> At least I have a making a fire from, from finally. Hey, Cindy, what's going on? There we go. Maybe, maybe like that. <laughs> At least there's some sort of heat going on in the house. So what's this thing about, uh, I was trying to look at it about Richard Allen. Did he get more charges or something? I wasn't sure what I just saw on law and crime. Hey, what's going on? Well, this is going to be my night show here. Uh, it's probably like, I don't know. My room's probably 45, and the living room here is probably 60 now, maybe, with the fire going on. I don't know. Yeah, I'm going to have to go look this up. That's funny. Right after that hearing, he gets more charges. Now, that was yesterday. We already knew that. We covered that yesterday about getting his lawyers back. No, no. I saw something else. Long Crime had something else on there. Yeah. Uh, oops. Uh, shoot, I got it. God, did I really forget to do that? I don't even know if I can... I'm not sure how to pause the stream to connect to... My hotspot was on, but now it's not on. Let me see if I... Hmm, I don't know. Maybe there's a quick way to do that in here. Setting. Okay. Now maybe. Might be able to do something. What do you mean, oops, what? What do you mean is my generator broken? What do you God, you guys are just crazy people. Just where do you come up with stuff like that? So, what was the law and crime situation? Was there more um, charges or what? What's going on with that? They're in their crate. They don't like the popping sound. Reminds them of uh, fireworks. Yeah, it's like it says... It says law and crime. So, hold on, let's just hear what this says. Recordings just got better. 
Hey, it's Dana from Streamyard. I'm so excited to announce that new charges against the alleged Delphi murderer who prosecutors New charges. responsible for the brutal murders of two Indiana teens wow. driven seven years ago. Prosecutors filed this request the same day as the Indiana Supreme Court made a major yeah, ruling. That's hilarious. When the prosecution goes into a trial, they want to cover all their bases. And by including the murder counts for intentional, the murder counts for felony murder, and the underlying kidnapping, it really protects them. We've been following the case of Richard Allen long before wow. his arrest in October 2022. The crime itself dates back to February. Can you hear this? Okay. 13-year-old Abigail Williams and her friend, 14-year-old Liberty German. Ah, you gotta be kidding. 14-year-old Liberty German went missing. What is going on here? 14 year old Liberty German went missing in the small Hoosier town of Delphi. The girls had been hiking along a bridge and trail in the area, and the next day their bodies were recovered nearby. I always thought they had kidnapping in there. Before an arrest was made, the public only being shown a composite drawing of a potential suspect and the so Okay, great. What's the new? Removed from the case and that the case had to trial within 70 days. The relief that Mr. Allen wants is he wants attorneys Baldwin and Rosie on the case and he wanted a speedy trial. And in order to show that that's an intimate part of the trial tactics and decisions that were going on was to present that to the court and make sure that this court had an opportunity to rule on it if it wanted to do Does so. Does your argument depend on our having found that the trial court's underlying findings of gross negligence and incompetence were wrong? No. I, I, well, if, if, and so I don't know when I'm going to be able to get back to having my regular studio or whatever. Um, see, the problem is, is our transformer went out on our small little street, okay? So, um, you know, they're going to get all the big area clusters first and then work their way out to the, you know, if of our, I kind of wish it was a transformer somewhere else that we were in a chain on, but we're not on one of those, so I have no idea. But anyways, this is uh, my live stream for the night. I don't have a goal or anything set up on top of the screen. But uh, if you guys want to help support the channel, it allows me to keep going here. I've had some really shitty weather circumstances here. Uh, earlier I showed you guys what's going on. I mean, there's literally trees inside of houses, like just crushing them. And my yard is just plastered with ice and you know like these massive branches from my neighbor's trees and you know it's just it is what it is so we're just doing the show from here uh, maybe it's not interesting for people but uh you know try my best i really it's hard to you have to just kind of focus in on trying to i mean you kind of see how early humanoids lived right like they, they spend the whole day trying to make sure everything is you know, ready to go, you know, so you can survive through the day, you know. You know, luckily we have things like you can charge a battery, but, you know, again, like right now I'm charging my generator, my electric generator inside my car, you know, using the, like, um, some sort of a, a lighter connection. Hey, thanks, Olivia. Let me just look online here. Maybe we can just read something. It's better. Let's see. Um, new charges. Richard. Allen. Oh, of course, that's not going to work. Alan. 
And every freaking picture has a picture of the, the freaking murder sheet on it, man. It's just ridiculous. All right, here we go. Okay, I'm, I, I don't have time, alley kick. I got to just do my own thing over here. All right, so we got this. Uh, on the same day, the Indiana Supreme Court heard arguments uh, about whether or not the Richard Allen original defense team should be reinstated on the Delphi murders case. Uh, Carroll County Prosecutor Nicholas McClellan filed, filed new charges, new felony charges against Allen. Allen was previously charged with two counts of murder. Uh, I always thought, I always just thought this was a given, this felony murder part, that kidnapping was what made it a felony murder. After being accused of killing Abby Williams and Liberty German on the Monon High Bridge in Delphi in February of 2017. On Thursday, McClellan filed additional charges against Allen more than one year after his arrest. Allen now faces a total of four counts of murder and two felony counts of kidnapping. According to new filings, McLean argues that previously released investigative findings include cause that Allen kidnapped Abby and Libby by force prior to their murders near the Monon High Bridge. Due to Allen's committing the, uh, committing the act of attempting to commit Due to Allen committing the act or attempting to commit the act of kidnapping during the alleged murder, Allen can also be charged with two counts of felony murder when murder is committed during the act of another crime. I, th I thought that's what he originally was charged with. McClellan stated, these newly amended charges more accurately aligns with the charging information leveled against Allen in the high-profile murder case. Hmm. So it more accurately depicts it, but you know, what, why didn't you have that before? <sighs> ah, shit. I think I threw it too far back there. Ah. sure how to get that one back that's way back there <laughs> oh, God. it was working good a minute ago Whew. maybe that backlog will catch fire in a minute who the hell knows Yeah, I'm hoping it comes on too. Clear if new charges will be proposed trial date. What? If the new charges will affect the proposed trial date. I don't know. I always thought the I thought it was felony murder before. You know, like you you know that he kidnapped them and then they ended up dying after remember we've already talked about that a million times.
Let me see if I can check my email on here. Yeah, I can't play people's YouTube videos. So I don't, you know, if you're sending me links, you know, don't send me a YouTube video. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you. Well, what do you guys want to talk about? It's hard to even plan stuff here because you're just, there's no, I, I, my normal computer, I have four monitors and I have stuff pulled up and I'm work, loading them up and looking through stuff and building folders and all that. And I really don't have any, you know, there's no time to do that here. I'm just doing my show because I do shows. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know, so maybe we can just do one where, where we talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. There you go. That's a pretty good fire. I'm not cold in my living room. I wish there was a way to like funnel the heat all the way around through the house, but I don't really know how to do it. Um, God, I guess they were talking about some kind of like there was a van and there's blood evidence in a van in the Scott Peterson case and innocence. I, I don't know, man. I don't know why the Innocence Project, usually they only pick cases that they feel really certain that an innocent person got screwed. But there's no way Scott Peterson is innocent, okay? <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's so classic. And, and the facts all pointed to him. And he didn't even really... You know? Yeah, it kind of sucks for the Innocence Project. I don't know. It's like, even if they get a new trial and he's found not guilty because of some technicality and the jury was like, I don't know, you know, maybe this guy... That doesn't mean the Innocence Project did the right thing there, you know? It means that you... Uh, I mean, it, here's the thing. It's, I don't think it's the job of the Innocence Project to create reasonable doubt. You know, some sort of reasonable doubt that somebody else, some, you know, some lesser-minded person might go, you know, that sounds reasonable to me. Just like in the Idaho 4 case, all the wacko, wackadoodle people who think Brian Koberger is innocent. I mean, those people are nut jobs, right? So they exist. So the Innocence Project shouldn't be in that game at all. But what they should be doing is when they find, when there's somebody that's absolutely innocent, that they believe is innocent, that they go out and uh, try to get them freed and cleared. Yeah, we know, Olivia. We've donated money to them. I, I don't know why you need to explain what... Uh, <laughs> what the Innocence Project does. <laughs> yeah, every, everybody knows, you know. Um, he, he's, it's total bullshit, Sunflower. And I think you're just a troll. Somebody look up the date of that account. Scott Peterson is innocent. <laughs> what a load of crap. Somebody probably wrote a nice big check to the Innocence Project. I mean, he's over at the, he's at the marina fishing at like what was it Christmas Eve or 
Christmas Day in the daytime, and then she goes missing. Yeah, give me a break. What does that mean, May 2020 gray? What does that mean? I didn't ask for a date. I don't know what that means. Hey, thanks, the Broken Scout. Yep, having uh, one of those slow nights here on the uh, in the dark. I don't have any way to make the show better. Sorry about that, you guys. Right, right where it washed up. Then he changes his hair color because he's trying to... And he's dating some other person while his wife's pregnant. It just seemed really clear, and he's professing to be with her. How would that happen? Yeah, I mean, I'm not even a big connoisseur of that case, you know. I'm... Mm -hmm. Oh, the creation date. <laughs> I see. Okay. Of that account. Yeah, I mean, people just don't randomly show up and go, I think Scott Peterson's innocent. Yeah, those, those are usually trolls that do that. They're looking for to be the center of attention, you know. I don't think there's any rational people out there that think he's innocent. Yeah, right? Exactly. You never even tried to help search. At the very least, he has something to do with it, okay? There's no chance that he's just some, wow, just some random guy who just, he too lost a wife and a kid. I mean, hell, I don't even remember seeing, seeing him upset about anything. Do you remember that? Big TikTok trying to get him a new trial. Yeah. Well, I don't watch TikTok, so TikTok's a Chinese communist uh, wacko channel. Or playing, he was in Paris to Amber while at the. Yeah, I think he did it himself, too. I'm just saying, at the very least, he had something to do with it. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's like, um, there's just no chance all that stuff's accidental. Here, I'll leave the mic right over here. Can you guys hear me pretty good just like that? Or is it way better when it's on my shirt? All right, I'm going to go check the battery out. I'll get it to 75% or something. Got a little ways to go. 
I put it on TV. Sweet. Like all the way zoomed out, it looks like this. There we go. <laughs> all right, feels good. Two hours of nanny testimony? I don't think so. I already have it all edited. I just haven't been able to do anything. Plus, you know how it gets when we're just playing something, the support for the channel that drops off the face of the earth and we're already slow on a night that I can't really do what I normally do. And uh, I think it would just crash. Man, I wish I had some marshmallows, man. I'd be <laughs> roasting some marshmallows in that sucker right now. Oh, good. That's too bad, Daphne. I'll have to go watch a different show then. Sorry about that. Uh, she is kind of, she is pretty, the, the nanny. Yeah, you're, you're pretty, you're pretty lame, Daphne. What a, you're just, what a whining, complaining person on a show where I'm just struggling to get a show going and come in and cry like a little baby. Man, you sound like your little buddy now. Are these logs from your front lawn? Oh, they're ones that we stored. We had them stored dry. Uh, right now it's only, it's like 33 or 4 out, but I don't have any power, so. Um, I mean, I'm glad it's not like, uh, two nights ago where it was night. This just got really weird, because it was like 14 or 15 degrees, and then it seemed like it was over. We had that big tree, remember I showed you that big top of the tree that broke down, and then, then things seemed to be getting better, then the next day, Boom! It just absolutely got... It was supposed to be getting warmer and warmer and warmer. Then all of a sudden it went down to like 30 degrees, which is, you know, obviously below freezing. Then it rained, and it was really, really windy. And that just created absolute mayhem. I mean, there are so many branches and trees on the ground, it's startling. This weather has been wacky. Yeah. I feel... Hey, thanks, Gigi. Thanks for the view. It's beautiful. Pray for power. Yeah, it is kind of... I think it does look kind of neat on there. Fortunately, it made uh, Daphne nauseous. I'm not really a cell phone live streamer. I'm just kind of trying to get the hang of it. Been using it more, so hopefully at some point it will be better at it. Laura Ingalls? <laughs> yeah. 
a little, a little bit like that in, a, in sort of a homemade house sitting here with only a fire to keep you warm. No, oh, it was a nightmare. Yeah. It still is. I mean, and I don't know what... Uh, well, the thing is, I don't think it's going to get below freezing anymore. But man, that was... Uh, if you guys were watching that live stream today, you could see... I mean, I couldn't even show you all the devastation that was going on, to be honest. I'm probably going to uh, have a, my large tree torn down this spring, though. And hopefully we, we can convince the uh, our next door neighbor to trim the bottom 25 feet of her tree with these massive branches that just just want to fall over every time you even just look at them. They just look like they're going to break. Hang sheets. I don't know what that means. Never heard of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we get we lose power, especially when it's not normally just like in a snowstorm, but when you get the wind and ice storms, that's when we lose power. Here, because we have all these huge trees around. And massive branches just break off and knock out power lines. Hard to let's see. It's gonna be thirty-one here. So by the way, what are you guys' thoughts on that one case we were looking at last night with those three guys? What do you think? Think happened there. It was sort of weird, you know, when you look, think about it. I mean, the homeowner didn't say anything, but how would they have all died of fr freeze to death out there? How is that possible? Wouldn't you just knock on the door and go back inside, or if you didn't let, if you weren't let inside, you go to your car because all three of their cars were parked out front, right? So wouldn't you just go to your car and turn it on and heat yourself up again? I mean, something else seems to have happened, like. That they passed out from something. They, I bet you there's going to be a drug element to it. Maybe something like meth. And they it was a bad or, you know, something like, um, what's that one that everybody keeps dying on? I don't think it's booze. I think it's going to be a drug that they took, fentanyl, something like that. But it didn't kill them, but they were just out and then they froze to death. You know, something like that. That the actual cause of death is freezing to death, but a major contributor to put him in a position will be a drug of some sort. There's almost no chance that this just sort of, you know, three people just froze to death when they had access to a house and a car, and, you know. So that's why, I guess it is pretty weird when you look at it like that. You think they were drugged them? I don't know what that means. Sorry. You think somebody drugged them? Is that what is that girl code for that? And then the owner not reporting it. Right. I mean, why didn't he say anything? They were drugged by those. Maybe. Yeah. Never know. Hey, thank you so much. Joseph Brennan. I just hit the button because I'm cool. <laughs> Damn right. Yeah, I'm just trying I'm just waiting to get my uh 
electrical generator. It got down to like 45, 49% or 44%. Now it's almost 75 and that's probably enough. And then I'll just start charging it tomorrow again. It's weird how little gas you use just with your car idling. Don't you think that's weird? Like you don't really use that much gas at all. You can sit it, have it running for like four hours and you're not, you haven't even used a gallon yet. Seems like. Any, uh, what, so what were your thoughts? Yeah. So the host might have been involved with the reasoning that they passed out and died in the cold. And that's why he was scared to come forward. Something like that. Hold on a second. still looking at that massive branch down by the neighbor's house. Or not really even a branch, it's this huge <sighs> Here, I gotta go get some more wood. People still there? <sighs> yeah, that tree was huge. It fell over. It's weird how these people are out here doing... There was a guy at midnight that came out on our street to get rid of the wire off the ground and coiled it up. And, I mean, that's just crazy. That's when all these huge branches were falling. <sighs> I 
Let me see if I can find that one. Hold on a second. Probably do one more of a show on it at some point. Blue, calm down. Blue, calm down. Yep, no electricity. No way to upload videos. Uh, thanks to advanced DNA technology, Indiana State Police have been able to identify and close a cold case that was nearly three decades old. What the hell is this one? Yeah, it's the case involved. That's nah, different. That's a different one. Let's see. Yeah, I already was ready to go with this one. Yeah, this is 1975, not the one that I was reading. So the Indianapolis Metro Police Department detectives have solved a 1975 cold case involving the abduction and assault of three young girls. IMPD says the suspect abducted the trio over 48 years ago on August 19, 1975 at around 10.45 p.m. Candace Smith, Sherry Rottler, she was 13, and then Sherry Rottler, 11, or... Rottler Trick, 11, and K Kathy Rottler, 14, was leaving a gas station on Washington Street near Belmar Avenue on the city's east side. The girls decided to hitchhike, and a man driving a station wagon pulled over and offered to give them a ride. As the girls approached their destination, they attempted to get out of the vehicle but the suspect threatened them at gunpoint. I mean, actually, it's sort of a little bit like Richard Allen, right? And before uh, stopping the car near a cornfield in Hancock County. So he threatened them at gunpoint, and that was, I guess that was before stopping the car near a cornfield in Hancock County. Police detailed that the suspect forced the three girls out of the vehicle and bound two of them. He then proceeded to sexually assault one of the girls before stabbing her. During the attack, the suspect also stabbed the other two girls numerous times. As the, as the girls laid in the cornfield, the suspect fled the area. IMPD said the older girls walked towards the highway and flagged down help. All three victims survived. Okay. Wow, that's crazy. Let's, see, there's the, let's listen to that uh, press conference. And you guys, don't help. Uh, don't forget to help support the Great Hughes Investigates YouTube channel. I know this isn't our normal shows, but that's all I got for you.
Yeah, let's play this. Be here today. My name is uh, Kendall Adams. K e n d a l. Yeah. Hold on. Lee, last name Adams, and I'm Deputy Chief of Criminal Investigations Division. True. Not sure why it's pausing so much. It really is a good day and so on here with this bit of good news. I want to first. So Ivan's been telling a story and nobody's following what we're doing over here. <laughs> Jesus. Classic Ivan. Classic Ivan. Start by acknowledging the people who got us here today. Candace Smith. So I guess those girls are still alive in this interview here. Uh, Sherry Rottler Trick and Kathy Rottler. Huh. Uh, I don't know why this just keeps clock clocking. You know, maybe it doesn't have a good enough service. What do you mean I need a generic system? What the hell are you talking about, Cameron? Your bravery. How about you just go do something else, Cameron? And courage is. Cameron got all upset the other, he's over here pumping another channel, and I say, you can't do that, Cameron, Jesus, and he, he unmembers my channel because of it, what a, what a baby, Jesus Christ. All right, here we go. Mendable. I know you have waited a long time for this, but today, I'm honored to... Stand beside you three to let you know your case is officially closed. Thanks, Dana. I won't pretend to know what you're feeling today, but I maybe there's another version. Let me see. I do hope this is the first step in providing what closure the criminal justice system. Might just be that stream. Let me see if this one plays it better. Right, Ivan, right, right. All right, let's see. These are the three survivors, I think. Yeah, I just don't have any internet. I don't have anything. I have my cell phone, hotspot, and yeah, who knows? Probably just everybody's calling, using it. Jerry and our friend Candace. Forty-eight years ago, on August nineteenth. 1975, our lives were changed forever and we became survivors. By the grace of God, there were three men that stopped to help me and Candace after the attack. I'd like to take a moment to thank them today and recognize everything they did. It was Victor and Philip Parsons and Gary McCormick, which Philip and Gary have passed on. I have no idea. It was because of their help and their decision to stop the car and assist us that we are here today. <sighs> maybe, maybe YouTube would play better. Let me try that. I can play a press conference. Well, 1975. So probably... You know, 
61 or so. Thank you, Danny, ICORN, and Mile 457 Rose. Gray needs a generic system. What does that even mean? Does anybody know what that means? Gray needs a generic system. Anybody? Slasher. Yeah, I mean, I could. Show, I wish I could show you the pictures, but it's too dark in here. So I don't have the same even the setup that was in my office. Thank you, Jessica Schubach and Death by Chocolate. Yeah, let's see if there's. Um, it's on YouTube or not. Press conference. ISP Indiana Slasher. No. I don't know if, if anybody can find the link to it on YouTube. Let me know. It's I can't play it when it's just too slow like that. Thanks, Michelle H. Yeah, I've already got a good generator. I don't need advice on that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's just, it's a, a electric one. I'm just charging it because I want to. I wouldn't even really have to. It would last through the night. And I, bought, I have two more of those. It might be good to have an electric, I mean, a gas-powered one, too, though, I guess. just doesn't, didn't make any sense at the time. Way past talking about that. Thank you, Peter. Mm. <laughs> if you can find the YouTube press conference on that, let me know. I think they can press their video better. Ah, they're doing good. They're just in their crate. Apparently. Didn't know electric generators were a thing. Yeah, they were awesome. What's cool about them is you plug them into the wall and keep them charged. And you also, when you know a storm's coming, you plug it into the wall and it charges. And you plug your refrigerator into it. And then 
once the, if the power goes out, it just kicks right over to the generator and it lasts like 24 hours of, um, you know, for the refrigerator. You know, so you can even turn it off at times and then turn it back on, but it's probably better just to leave it on. Usually your power is back on quicker than that. And then there's minute, little ones that you can take camping and they have solar um, like connections that you can put on them. And so when you're out camping, you know, you can leave it sit there all day and the sun will charge up your generator for you. You know, the gas ones obviously are better. They're just louder and, and there's zero noise at all. Yeah, did you send it on YouTube? I've already got the press conference. I asked for it on YouTube if that's what you got. And I did just send it an email because I don't have the ability to get to Facebook when I'm streaming. My neighbors have all the other, uh, what do you mean, what? <laughs> Jesus. Just, I need an email sent to me of the video, okay? I explain why. Um, yeah, my neighbor has gas powered for their water. So their water heater is still working, which is cool. And they have a gas heater downstairs so their whole house stays heated so that's something to think about too you yeah. know uh, she's she's just over at her kid's house she was here earlier and you know it, maybe i'll come get her but she's kind of like well the room might get too cold so she might stay back over there again Yeah, I'm checking my email. I don't have an email with the YouTube press conference. I already played the press conference, tried to twice on two different articles and it wasn't working. I was thinking YouTube might be quicker. Yeah, we already know that circuit then. We, we were talking about that 20 minutes ago. What the? What? That's crazy. Your house exploded, right? All right, did anybody send me the YouTube video? Guess not. I can't get on the Facebook on my um, iPad or my uh, notepad over here. I'm not signed into it. So my phone is, but I'm streaming with my phone. Anyway, anyways, you know, when Cameron said that, I just didn't really care because we just sort of bailed <laughs> right after that one night when 
he kept mentioning the channel over and over and over again. It was weird, and and because he got called out on it, he, he unmembered himself. Pretty childish. If you ask me. So I really didn't care what, what a generic anything was, you know. Must have a power brick or something to run the tech equipment. Huh? No, I do, well, I just have like a... Uh, yeah, I do have a backup power supply for two different devices, but I'm streaming just using my cell phone. But I think I definitely need a new cell phone. Wow, Sandy came back? She, she pouted and, wa and stomped away, and she came back. Wow, that's awesome. Let's see. Saw your video earlier. What a minute. Oh, yeah. Well, it was so much worse than that. I saw these times where these huge trees were lying on top of power lines that they had squished into the bushes. Cracking up over there. da da ba What I was looking for. I'm just hoping it plays. Thanks, Zozo, for sending that. Know what you're feeling today. But I do hope this is the first step in providing what closure the criminal justice system can. You've waited nearly 50 years for this. And I also must acknowledge those who have fought alongside you for the answers. I would like to recognize retired Lieutenant Steve Gibbs, who's here with us today in the back. He was with the Marion County Sheriff's Office at the time, who started looking into this cold case in 1990 and then again in 20, uh, 2003. Gibbs was instrumental in locating case documents and preserving them, which laid the foundation for Sergeant Ellison and Sergeant Dave Elliston, who recently retired from IMPD Unsolved Homicide Unit, worked to secure funding necessary and ultimately led us to an answer, which brought us all here today. This break, breakthrough demonstrates the power of science, perseverance, and never ending pursuit of truth. This investigation demonstrates the commitment of our unsolved homicide unit, which is formerly known as cold case, investigators to bring justice to victims, families, no matter how much time has passed. It demonstrates our commitment to justice and the key role the unsolved homicide unit plays. My message today, if you commit a crime in Indianapolis, we're going to hold you accountable, no matter how long it takes. While we would like to do this immediately, this may take years, but we never yeah, stop you, looking for answers. I'm now happy to turn it over to Sergeant Dave Ellison, who never stopped looking for those answers, who will briefly give you a rundown of the case. Good morning. My name is Dave Ellison. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm recently retired. After 35 years and 13 years in the unsolved homicide unit, I'd like to thank Chief Bailey, Chief Adams, Captain Spurgeon, the unsolved homicide unit for allowing me to participate 
today and help bring closure to our survivors here. I want to briefly go over the facts and what got us to this point. It was back on August 19th, 1975, that Sherry, who was 11 years old, Candy 13, and Kathy 14, walked to the bonded gas station on East Washington Street, which was on the far east side. They made some purchases, left the gas station, went out onto the street. They decided they're going to hitchhike and go to Post Road. While they were doing that, a white male driving a station wagon stopped his vehicle uh, to give him a ride. He instructed them all three to get into the front seat. As they left and proceeded to Post Road, Kathy, who was seated next to the driver, noticed that he wasn't stopping. She pointed out to him that it was Post Road, their stop, and he seemed to accelerate and kept going. He continued on US 40 towards Greenfield and past Cumberland, continued out just past the National Drive-In, where he stopped and turned around. Now, while he was doing that, Kathy was becoming upset. She told one of the girls to try to get out of the car. When one of the girls went to reach for the door handle, it had been removed, and they could not get out. Kathy tried to hit the brake pedal, but her foot was not, her leg was not long enough. So she was unsuccessful. It was at that time that the suspect pulled it. So that's exactly, you know, it's weird. Remember I've told you guys that story when I was in a van coming back from basketball practice and he dropped everybody else off, but he kept me. And I said, hey, I live right here. And he just kept driving and driving. And I was like 12 years old. Yeah. That's exactly what I was thinking when I heard this part here. That, that must have had that same feeling, except they were in an actual situation. I don't know what happened in mine if I, he just changed his mind or whatever, but it's that same feeling, I'm sure. Got a handgun, put it to her head, and threatened to shoot her. As a result, they were totally complying at that point. He turned his vehicle around, heading back westbound on US 40 to 700 west where he turned north. He went down a little bit, found a farmer's lane, drove back the lane to a cornfield, found an open spot and parked. At that point, he instructed one of the girls to get out of the car. While he bound the other two, the girl was taken to the front of the car where she was sexually assaulted. She was then stabbed repeatedly throat was cut. He then went back to the other two girls that he had bound and gagged and be, got them out of the car and proceeded to stab them as well, leaving them for dead. They actually played dead to try to avoid being stabbed anymore. He eventually leaves and flees the area. Kathy and Candy managed to make their way out of the cornfield, make their way to US 40, where cars are going past. Eventually, them. one I mean, stops. The uh, it was Gary McCormick and Victor Parsons. Victor was going to be here today, but uh, something came up suddenly and he couldn't make it. I'm sorry. I know you were looking forward to seeing them. They both got help. They got the police and they got medics. The police got into the cornfield, quickly found Sherry and got her life-saving aid. They were all trained, transported to the hospital. Um, Sherry was in critical. Candy and Kathy were in serious condition. Obviously, they're here today. They all survived. The investigation involved multiple jurisdictions. It started in Marion County. It went to Hancock County. As a result, those two agencies were the primary. Indiana State Police supported, as well as the Indianapolis Police Department. 
Act. Police agencies diligently worked the case, collecting evidence from the crime scene, conducting interviews, responding to tips from the public, and following up on leads on several different possible suspects. However, the case eventually went cold, cold no arrests were made. Over the years, our survivors made contact with the police department, periodically checking for any new developments. Then we fast forward to 2018, and that's when I met Kathy. I was actually walking through the hallway, Kathy was in the hallway, and one of our chiefs at the time, Chief McCart, asked if I could help Kathy. I spoke to her, we went into our conference room, she explained what happened to her. Uh, I could see how traumatic it was at the time and how it had impacted their life forward. I asked if she could get the other two ladies to come in and we'd sit down and talk. Um, that eventually occurred, and while talking to them, uh, it was just very sad what happened to them. So, of course, I said I would try to help. I explained my primary responsibilities, which are dealing with unsolved homicides, and that it would require patience on their part because I couldn't just drop everything and work this case. I would work on it on free time and whenever I could. And they agreed with that. Yeah, it was a commercial on YouTube that played. When you think about an unsolved homicide or cold case, it presents many challenges. Uh, the older the case, the more challenges that it does. First thing you want to do is find a file. So locating it is not always as easy as it may seem. Um, witnesses that existed when an incident occurred often may not still be around. Police officers may not be around. Medical personnel. All these things are important and critical to That's any crazy. criminal prosecution. Yeah. So as you're doing your investigation, you're hoping that all those exist, but there's always roadblocks. How many people are going to type in that the home Fortunately, Lieutenant Steve generator? Gibbs uh, looked at this in 1990 and 2003, and it was his work that helped me. It laid a foundation for me to go forward. I know Steve's here, so Steve, thank you for what you did. In 2019, evidence was located, and it was in Hancock County Sheriff's Department. Evidence was transported to the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Maybe Department, again. and after reviewing items, we started targeting. It's like the fourth person has typed in Generac is a home security, or you know whatever the hell it was. Items in and increments. A home standby generator for the fourth time. Were put in. Uh, and basically, you're then waiting for results. And I'm working on other cases. I have trials. We're digging for bodies. A lot was going on in 2020. 2021, we began looking at an original suspect that was in the case. And then later, we were notified by the Marion County Forensic Services Agency that one of the items had produced a, a DNA profile of an unknown male. That was in 2021. Additionally, we had submitted more items, two more items, um, revealed DNA from an unknown male profile. All three of those male profiles matched each other, and one of the items had Sherry Rottler's DNA on it. It was at that point that we knew we had our suspect's DNA. That is not going to fit back here. Hey, did you hear that drop? Did you hear the music drop, everybody? Valentine.
time, stay safe. Ah, did you hear that? Listen, everybody. The, we knew we had our suspect's DNA. The lab uh, is responsible for passing along um, the information and the DNA, DNA sample that ultimately gets uploaded to the state laboratory, Indiana State Police, and then if it meets certain requirements, it'll go to a program that's called CODIS. CODIS is an acronym. It stands for Combined DNA Index System. It is a criminal justice program and it is maintained by the FBI. So after our profile got put into CODIS, uh, we weren't getting any results which we had hoped for. That tells us two things. Either our person didn't do anything else ever, or he's deceased, or he was locked up before, before the CODIS program started. So his DNA was never taken. Uh, the suspect, the, the original suspect, had, was deceased. An additional suspect we had identified on our own was also deceased. We identified family members. We went to them, explained what was going on. Both families were great. They cooperated, provided DNA samples, which allowed us to eliminate those suspects. In January of 23, I reached out to DNA Laboratories, DNA Labs International of Florida. They have genetic genealogy completed for our suspect profile. Funding for this testing was provided by a community partner, Audio Chuck, Season of Justice, and that's Ashley Flowers over here on the far side. We're so thankful for the money you provided to help us. Thank you. So one of, is anybody here from DNA Labs? Yeah. Steve? Yeah. Steve was instrumental. He's helped us before uh, in situations uh, getting funding. And Steve, thanks for your efforts. Thanks for the liaison with Ashley and DNA Labs. Appreciate it. Uh, well, you also wouldn't be here today without both of them. Last year, the genealogist at DNA Labs International used websites such as FamilyTree.com, JetMatch.com, and DNA of the suspect to identify ancestors and most importantly, a daughter and a son of the suspect. Sergeant Columbus Ricks and Detective Chuck Benner of the, of the Unsolved Homicide Unit followed up on, on the suspected children. Both of these individuals were very cooperative. They identified their father and provided DNA samples for comparison. As a result of that testing by DNA Labs International this past December, they were able to confirm the match between the suspect DNA and the daughter and the son. The suspect has been identified as Thomas Edward Williams, born May 21st, 1934 in Indianapolis, Indiana. He died November 13th, 1983 in prison in Galveston, Texas. That's also where he's buried. Cold case investigators were able to link Thomas Edward Williams to Indianapolis during that general time period and at one point living not far from the Dushan location. There's an event of biblical proportions happening on April 25th, 2024, and it's nowhere seen on the news. CNN isn't on location. Six years ago, Kathy, Sherry, and Candace approached me about this case, and I promised I would do my best to get them answers they deserve. So I want to thank you for your patience. And mostly your persistence, never giving up, never trying to hold the police department accountable to help and answers for you. This was an act of evil that none of you deserved. 
I hope today brings you some sort of closure, knowing that your attacker has been identified. He's no longer in this world. The unsolved homicide unit the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department is honored to be able to have helped Thank bring you. closure. Thank you. I'll now turn it over to Kathy, Sherry, and Kathy. Now we can get three people surviving for you. Getting up there. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Kathy Rotler. I'm joined here with my sister Sherry yeah, and our friend Candace. Okay. 48 years ago, on August 19th, 1975, our lives were changed forever and we became survivors. By the grace of God, there were three men that stopped to help me and Candace after the attack. I'd like to take a moment to thank them today and recognize everything they did. It was Victor and Philip Parsons and Gary McCormick, wow, I've which Philip and Gary have passed on. Wow. It was because of their help and their decision to stop the car and assist us that we are here today. Soon after our case went cold and I tried to keep the case open, but it seemed every call I made was met with another dead end. Then in the late 1990s, I got a call from Lieutenant Steve Gibbs, who is now retired, and I'd like to thank him for trying to solve our case, even coming back from retirement to continue to work on it. That too came to an end, but I was determined not to give a, give a sorry, uh, that too came to an end, but I was determined not to give up, and a few years, oh, I can't read this, a few years by, went by before I contacted the cold case unit again. It was after that exchange that David Ellison began to keep, David began to keep me informed on what was happening with our case. Even after he retired, he has kept in touch with me until we got here today. I want to thank all the investigators who worked on this case, some who are in this room, many who are not. I also need to acknowledge my family, who has been, who has been by my side the entire time. That includes my sisters and children who are here with me today, and my mom and sister who have passed on and my father who could not be here today. I stand here before you today as a survivor who has learned the true meaning of patience. I've learned that sometimes the answer you are waiting for can take decades to get, nearly five decades in fact, but I feel it's all on God's time and it was well worth the wait. There were times over the past 48 years that I felt no one was working on this case, but I kept hoping and praying, and I'm so glad that I kept my faith in myself. I'm so glad I kept faith in myself and investigators. My message is to other survivors out there is never give up and continue to fight to keep your case open. This day, this is a day I never thought would come, but I told myself to keep going and never to stop searching for answers. Today we got our answers, and I'm so thankful for that. I'd like to turn to turn it over to Steve from DNA Labs International. Thank you. You know, I think it was funded by Audio Chuck. They, they're like us, you know, they fun stuff. And uh, I was talking to Misty today. The, it's pretty interesting, uh, the Medina County one she's working on. Probably pretty interesting stuff. I guess we'll see later. But Audio Chuck does the same thing that we do. Fund DNA cases. I have something to say. I'm sharing. 
I'm very thankful to everyone for your help. But I also want to indicate that I do forgive this man. I had to in order to, to continue to live my life. So I hope that anybody who's in, in this situation can please do the same. Because that's what God wants you to do. No, it's not I forgive you. I don't forgive you. I will never forgive you. Okay. Well, I forgive the man, and I thank the children. Thomas Edward Williams, you have forgiven me. I'm sorry if that makes anybody mad, but that's in my heart. Hi, everyone. I'm Steve DuBois from DNA Labs International. Um, just to go into a little bit about how the genealogy part of this case was done. Um, DNA Labs is a private forensic lab that's based out of South Florida. Uh, we, um, our genealogical process, meaning the process that was used to create this profile that was allowed us to identify, help identify the suspect, is accredited through the ANAB. Um, around 12 months ago, uh, Dave, Sergeant Dave Ellison called me and started talking about this case. There are a lot of steps to go through for a genealogical case to move forward. There's a lot of boxes that have to be checked. Literally, probably 10 minutes into the phone call, I realized that this case was a very good um, candidate for genealogy and that it needed to be moved forward. Uh, I made a few phone calls. Um, I was able to talk to Ashley and we were able to move this case forward with DNA Lab International. Um, we got a sample from the Indianapolis Marion County Forensic Lab. We took that sample forward using the Contelligence Kit and we were able to create a genealogical profile. That profile was then downloaded to the approved law enforcement databases and then our genealogists took over at DNA Labs International. Our genealogists were able to come up with a suspect and with close relatives that matched. So then what we did you know, so Audio Chuck has, uh, they, you know, they have a ton of podcasts that they make money from, and they upload. And I have just my channel and an income that comes in that allows me to donate money at the end of each month out of the income as well, just like Audio Chuck, except they don't get the same trolls over and over and over again. But uh, the only way to do that is if uh, on a nightly basis you guys help support the channel, I realize that I'm not able to produce the same high quality work that uh i always do but uh if you can figure out a way to help support the channel nevertheless i would appreciate it because it allows me to also donate a large portion of my income to uh, our dna project and as well as a ton of other things all right so consider that when you think of can i help support gray hughes's channel tonight we took that information, gave it back to the detectives at IMPD, and they were able to go to those family members, get samples. Those samples were brought back, and in kinship testing, we were able to confirm the original um, SDR profile that was used out of the case. So basically, you're taking a genealogy, or an SDR profile, which is a normal forensic... How come when... Let me ask you guys something. How come when I said, man, I would never be able to forgive something like that? <laughs> Nobody made a comment. When I said that, you ever wonder about that? It's a police profile, which we cannot use in genealogy. And then out of the DNA, we're creating a genealogy profile that can use uh, to move forward in this type of research. Um, those two swaps were used. We did the kinship testing, and obviously, that's why we're here today. Um, we would be really remiss, obviously, if we didn't talk about these three ladies and their bravery. We'd also be remiss in talking about the detectives, the crime scene personnel, and the laboratory personnel that preserved evidence for over 40 years. Yeah, that's pretty funny there, isn't it? Was like... Recordings just got better. Hey, it's Dana from StreamYard. I'm so excited to announce that local... I've done this a long time. 
That's how a major win. I said, Someone else who made this happen. I think I said, forgive, no thank you. I, there's no, no way. Something like that. Um, Ashley Flowers from Audio Chuck. I'm just going to pass it on. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Ashley Flowers. I'm from a local media company called Audio Chuck. Um, and when we got the call from Steve uh, saying that there, the issue now, we, we think we can solve this case, the only issue is funding, it wasn't even a question. Uh, we've been committed to our city and specifically to solving unsolved homicides within the city for six years now. And we, we couldn't have written that check faster. Um, so I am grateful that we were given the opportunity to stand up here with everyone else, but truly we played the smallest part in this. The three of you have been fighting since day one for almost 50 years. You've been fighting and advocating for yourselves. You are the reason we are here, and I think so many people, including myself, are going to look up to you, and your message to survivors is so powerful. So thank you for, for fighting every day, because I know it wasn't, I know it wasn't easy. And thank you guys for listening, because it's, it sounds simple, but I, I've seen a lot of departments not listen. And the work that you guys did behind the scenes is absolutely incredible. Wouldn't be here without you. And I know everyone wishes this could have come sooner. And I think the truth of the matter is, is the technology wasn't there. And now we have this brand new tech that gives me so much hope that so many other unsolved homicides can be closed out as well. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just close with this. Um, yeah, I think Ashley said Here's what I would say. I think that everybody who says that they forgive, they're looking for, like, applause from people. Like, wow, you're so above it. And, but in reality, they never forgive gave that person. Okay? <laughs> There's no chance. That's why they If they really truly forgave the person, they wouldn't be fighting for justice for all those years. They'd just be like, yeah, I don't, don't worry about it, man. I, I forgave that guy a long time ago. Instead, they're fighting for justice. That means there's something there that they just can't forgive. So I don't even believe it when people say that. I think they do it for sort of the uh, same thing when people say, I would never let my kid do that. You know, moral superiority. Something there, and Kathy said something that, that I think needs to be reiterated. There are many families in our community um, that are seeking justice uh, for their loved ones, that their cases remain unsolved. I hope today gives us all a little bit of hope uh, that those cases remain on, on our radar, they remain with our unsolved homicide unit. Well, they say, they'll say it's not about for, you know, it's not about them that you forgive, it's to, well, you forgive to free your own self so that you don't, you're not filled with hate. And yet, you're, there you are, continuing to fight for justice when you could have just moved on and never thought of it again because you forgave, right? And it's all good now. And I would encourage any of you who are listening today who want answers to reach out to our Victim Assistance Unit at 327-3475, 3475. That's our main homicide unit. They will connect you with our Victim Assistance to try to track down the answers that you need because these cases never go away and today is a shining example of that so i just want to uh also acknowledge uh candace sherry and uh, Catherine, and give them another round of applause questions No questions? Yes, this is for Candace, Sherry, and Catherine, if I'd ask any of or anything else. But if you go to the mic again, what does this mean to you guys? It means closure for me. I'm at peace now within my heart. It, mean, it means closure for me. I'm Candace. Mm -hmm. um, it's put peace within my heart. And it uh, also gave justice to my parents and the brother that's passed as well and uh i'm a survivor thank you it's 
some of the family members are here too. Thank I you for being here. I know signal. that you've also been a part of this journey, so thank you. Yeah, sort of like a it's, it's virtue signaling or trying to. It's usually somebody who's you know recently found God or this really religious person that goes, "Oh, I forgave them a long time ago." You know, I mean, I think that's up to God to forgive, not uh, you know people. <laughs> I think uh, uh, people like this deserve vengeance. Right. Have you wondered why your wrist getting painful? So yeah, me, I have. Yeah. Huh? All right. Well, how's everybody doing? How long have we been doing this? Hour and a half, geez. Man. I wonder what makes, like, what makes tonight different than last night? You know? It's just always weird to me. I don't really have any extra. I mean, I'm just trying to get the show going and doing a show. Did you just get here? Probably. Huh? I'm gonna keep zooming in and out. Daphne's still around. I'm gonna keep going like this. Try to make her vomit. Well, maybe what I'll do is I'll just end the show and I'll try to figure out a way to watch the. Uh, Maybe I can, I don't know, if I get my, get the generator in here, fire up the laptop, sign in on a VPN using my, ah, that probably wouldn't work. Because I'd have to use my cell phone. Maybe it would. Don't have a way even to put myself in jail. It's just, uh, you know, <laughs> absolutely crazy I, mean, I just gave you the spiel how we need to raise money on every single night for the show and tonight's one of those ones where it just fell on deaf ears but whatever i don't know i'm not going to be able to get my power back on anytime soon so we're going to be really behind at the end of the month and i can't force them to come turn it on and we're going to be last because we're on the edge. We're not one of the main hubs of the power. They are aware it's been assigned, all of that, but can't do anything about it. Mm, I think it's about Richard. It's, it's about punishment for committing a crime to keep other people from committing a crime. So that's your opinion of what justice is. I don't agree with you. It's not about restoration. It's about uh, punishment for, you know, it's getting, making things right in the world by punishing people for doing heinous things or whatever they do in a manner that perhaps will be a deterrent for other people from doing the exact same thing. Haven't made what? Why would they make it a man of priority? <laughs> I only have nine people on my street, so they wouldn't that wouldn't be something they would do. Yeah, you type that in like every second of every show of this account. Yep, justice for Abby and Libby. Yep, 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 yep. We covered the case a lot. Uh, you seem like you're mono focused. I'm, uh, yeah. Yeah, it sucks. We, 
We talked about uh, how Richard Allen got extra charges yesterday. I think that Richard Allen is 100% guilty. And I think that his daughter is going to maybe you know, play a role at some point in this case. That's what I think. So, you know, for me, is Richard Allen to me is the perfect person to be. Is everyone always goes, how could it be Richard Allen? Richard Allen is absolutely perfect. He's a guy that you wouldn't suspect. He's like the a Dennis Rader, you know. Here he is, this guy working at a a pharmacy. You know, looking even at pictures that people send in, uh, probably people that he was interested in. And then one day, you know, whether, you know, the Keegan Klein, there's got to, I mean, my thing is I think there's the Keegan Klein connection. But one day he said to himself, I am, I'm going to do it today, right? So whether or not he got advice that they were going to be there because he was in a hurry. He seemed to know that Abby and Libby were going to be there that day. So he gets out there, takes them, uh, you know, he got there at about 1.30. He passed three girls that were on the trails. They saw him and he saw them. And he continues to walk down the trail towards the start of the bridge. And when he gets to the start of the bridge, he's standing on the bridge and he's standing on platform one when another woman shows up and sees him standing there on platform one. She sees him on there. And then she turns around and then passes Abby and Libby. Then you know that Abby and Libby will next see Richard Allen. And this is because Richard Allen said this is who he is. This is just like, almost like Koberger saying, well, I drive around late at night, uh, you know, because I know that I'm seen. And then he kidnaps them, kills them, and leaves. And then nobody knew who the hell he was, even though maybe his wife, you know, the funny thing is, is it seems like if his wife saw the picture, she would have gone, man, that looks just like my husband. And the, uh, the daughter would have said the same thing. And then Richard Allen has these creepy tie-dye picture of his daughter laying on the bed wearing one of Libby's tie-dye shirts. Pretty crazy. But, you know, after five, six years, apparently some tip came in. And there's, there's rumors out there that, that the tip to look at it came from um, his, you know, somebody related to Richard Allen, let's put it that way. That that's where the tip originally said, make go look back at this. And then they went and found the original narrative from the conservation officer. And then it led to, um, you know, that, that led to Richard Allen. And then Richard Allen at the time, he called right when the murders happened, right after him. He called to turn in a tip because he knew that was him. He goes, oh my God, that's me. They've got me. I don't know how they got that photo, though. Um, I'm going to turn myself in and see what's going on. And they didn't say anything to him. In fact, they just sort of lost the tip for years. They would have made an arrest in that case uh, two weeks, maybe a week after the murders, had uh, they'd actually known what the hell they were doing. Yeah, I know, Cindy. I'm just not trying to say that. That's why I didn't say it, Cindy. God, it just... <sighs> Every time. Like you just can't say anything on here. <clears throat> Yeah.
Yeah. 24 star badge. All right. Hmm? Yeah, notice how I didn't say exactly who. I said family members. I didn't want you to go blabbing away who the... Yeah, you'd think that the wife would have seen that, yeah. And, then, and Richard Allen's confessed to it. He admits to wearing exactly the same clothing and being in the area at exactly the right time. And he had to have passed Abby and Libby. And he's the guy on the bridge. He, so that means he's the killer. Because the guy on the bridge is responsible for, at minimum, kidnapping. And therefore, that's felony murder right there. No, I can be sure. It is Richard Allen. When you say we can never be sure. It is Richard Allen. I'm 100% certain Richard Allen is the guy on the bridge. 100%. I don't have any any doubt or anything like that. You almost have to be a fool to think to have doubt. Look at that. So Amber Maiden had to do her own wave follow-up. <laughs> I mean, how sad is that, you guys? But thank you, Amber. See, when people go, I don't know, man, I just don't think there's enough information for me to believe it's Richard Allen, I always look at you and go, please, please never serve on a jury, okay? You're an embarrassment, all right? Because he did it, Jordis. He's, he's the killer. <laughs> you sound like an absolute whack job. I don't need to be there. <laughs> hey everybody you have to be there you have to witness the crime to have a comment about it everybody you have to be be there what the kind of a dumbass comment is that man those are the kind of comments that are embarrassing on social media these people that just think they're so high and mighty and they're just ridiculous give me a break How do, how do we crucify somebody when we weren't even, we weren't even there? Yeah. Cry me a river. Yeah, everyone wants them to have a, a, tri a trial, sure. Yeah, everybody does. Yeah. Yep, everyone wants him to have a trial and let all the facts come out. And if he's found not guilty, he's found not guilty. Doesn't mean he didn't do it. It means that the jury didn't see, think that there was enough evidence. Thank you, WNC Granny. Who's, look at that. People are following Amber's secondary wave. <laughs> It was almost like starting a car, you know, like uh, in the in the snow, and it started. Amber started, and it started to roll down the street, and then it died again. And she's tried it again. She started it up again, and then hey, here I'll read you guys the comment up here. It's absolutely ridiculous. How can we crucify someone? For committing a crime that we didn't witness for ourselves, that goes for any and all cases. Not trying to offend you guys. Oh my God! Why don't you start your own cult? I mean, that sounds like a a leader of a cult would say. You know, like some kind of weird. <laughs> some guy was coughing and coughing right next to me and got me sick, so now I'm sick again. Oh, really? Jesus. Man, you almost have to run away when somebody coughs these days. 
Yep, we just got the fire going here. I'm, I'm actually, we have this, like, you know those bundles of wood you can buy? I, I went through, blasted through about five, six of those already. And now I'm going through our literal branches of trees that have fallen off over the years and they're dry underneath this tarp that uh, my wife actually set up. <laughs> it looks like a pretty cool little system. She's so clever at stuff like that. Yeah, they, they kind of just disappear really quick because they're so dry and they just... This, uh, the wood off the tree seems to kind of burn a little hotter, has a little sap in it, like a little more popping sound for sure. You know what's weird about COVID? It's like it's different. You, know, you can just keep catching it and catching it and catching it and catching it and it just seems like... It doesn't matter if you caught it last week and you got over it, you're going to you, you, you get exposed to it again. You get it again. You know, there's not really like your immune system just sort of helps you battle it, but it doesn't keep you at all from not catching it. Even if you had just got over it and you're, you know, you got this great immunity set up, it just seems like it doesn't matter. Jordis, now you're sounding passive aggressive. You know that your original comment was just ludicrous, right? Embarrassing, really. I mean, I guess when we see those mass shootings in some video, we shouldn't condemn the person because we weren't there. Yeah, we see the video and everything, but we weren't there, so who the hell are we, right? And the thing is, you know what? COVID. Um, even the FBI now says it was created in a lab. So for all the people that thought, oh, God, you're a conspiracy nut job, uh, it really was created in a lab and it escaped from the Wuhan lab of virality, virality, virology. And they, um, virality. <laughs> it really did escape from there. It wasn't, it's not, that's not a, uh, a hoax. And it, what's, what's really weird about it, there's these two Chinese guys on the internet that, they were reading the articles. I mean, they weren't even Chinese. They were Americans that lived there, spoke fluent Mandarin. You know, they could, you know, wives from there and everything. And they were reading these things, and they even found the ad for hiring somebody at the Wuhan lab of, uh, of uh, virology, I think. And then the girl, the lady that was on the list, she disappeared. <laughs> uh, they were talking about this before we even got COVID over here yet. And it turns out they were 100% accurate. Yeah, I think it was just what they did was they, you know, what they're trying to do, the gain of function. So they make, take a virus and they make it more dangerous and then try to figure out how to stop it. But it got loose. And so now you got this super, this weird freaking virus that just kind of, I don't know, man. It's not good. It's not good. Man, I can't believe you're gonna you, you you can't convince and just keep that dog. They're like buddies. Eight six seven five three on that. Jesus, man, you better have it set up where they get to see each other. Yeah, I don't know if it's some bigger conspiracy or anything. But. One guy who didn't want to convict because the crime wasn't caught on video. God, people, that's the problem. See, for me, circumstantial evidence is huge in cases. Like, it's, oh my God, it's like, to me, circumstantial evidence is just as powerful as, it's actually is direct evidence of something. But circumstantial evidence for the overall case is huge, especially when you, link them together in a chain where by the time you're done it's there's no way there's no escaping here i mean that's the whole coburger thing for me hey by the way which case do you guys think is more 
cut and dry. Richard uh, Richard Allen or Koberger? I think Koberger is, is more just boom. They got that guy. <laughs> That's why it's so crazy that there's so many wackos. Yeah. But why can't you? <laughs> I mean, what, what was the deal where you had to ship it off? I guess I don't really know that part. All right, let me, I'm going to go get my battery. I guess I don't know the situation. Looks like a really cool dog, though. I, I think I'd miss it. Yeah, well, the sheath and the bullet are the, like, the sheath for Koberger and the bullet in Richard Allen's case, but the sheath with DNA is a lot more powerful than a, the bullet with ejection marks, in my opinion. But the circumstantial evidence with Richard Allen is huge. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I got this little chain in his, his information and the probable cause document. Puts it all together. Oh, cool. Glad you like the fire. That's at 79% though, that battery. That's pretty good. Got up almost 40 percent yeah people go why would a killer tell on himself well a killer who just saw himself on video and wants to get ahead of it that's exactly what you do yeah frida on my facebook page for the half and pincher rescue and then i call the leader of the rescue to tell her I could go get her, uh, go get her one of two. Is there more on there? Oh, one of two. I could go get it. No, I'm using a notepad. Not an iPad. It's an, it's an Android. An electric company. The trucks had to drive. Huh? I'm not sure what your house every day, but we were without power once for seven days because we were at the end of the. Right. Well, um, hopefully, when, you know. We'll just see how that goes. Hopefully we're not way down the list. Okay, the rescue lady told me that someone had called her already and wanted her, but she wouldn't be able to pick her up until after the holidays. It was an emergency case, so she needed to be picked up. They're pretty cool dogs, though those Affin pincers. <laughs> I think I think they would. Chloe would like to hang out with one of those. Pretty sure.
Uh, now he's charged with, I guess, just regular or felony murder and kidnapping. But I always thought that's what he was charged with before. Because it was a felony murder, right? You see him on tape. He's the one that kidnapped him. Up immediately, pick him up immediately because she was going to be taken to a kill shelter. Wow. The lady who contacted the rescue was actually my old friend from New York. So she had seen Frida in the post I reposted. So, <laughs> oh man. Well, at least maybe you can see her. Maybe that'll let, allow you to uh, be friend, see your friend more often again. Well, you should send me a link on to your hook up. Hook me up on Facebook, and then maybe I can get one of those. So I left the next day and got her in Reno, so she was already claimed by my friend before I even picked her up. If I weren't, so you went there just to basically save the life. Well, weren't they gonna keep her alive anyways, just even knowing that your friend was gonna go, was getting her? If it weren't my old friend, I would keep her and ghost the lady. <laughs> Frida original owner shot themselves while Frida was in the car and then the son inherited her. He was abused, oh yeah, that's stupid, that's crazy. Crazy story there. Hey, WNC Granny, you're gonna go to bed? All right. That's crazy though that you live right next to the electric company and they wouldn't even, like you'd think they would just come right down the street and help you guys out, you know? Maybe you didn't do your charm. Hey, what's going on here? Oh, man, my battery. Did I not turn this sucker on? I just said your battery is at 15%. I'm wondering if I didn't... Weird. Okay. Well, I guess that's the cue then, you guys. The battery is only 15% on the phone, even though I had it plugged in here. I think it was when you're streaming, it really eats through the, uh, especially when I was using it as a hotspot. <laughs> well, you are too, WNC Green. Well, Hope you get a different uh, Affen pincer. But anyways, you guys, I'm going to take off. So I appreciate your support on the channel. And we will see you hopefully tomorrow. Um, I don't know how that's all going to work. <laughs> but uh, you know, hopefully we get some power back at some point. Tomorrow's going to be a good day, I think, for the crews to get out there, I think. Should be pretty easy for them to get around. Yep. Yeah. Well, I need to get power back, because when you, you know, having shows like this make it tough. You know? I'm not able to do my regular show, the super chats dry up, and it's like, man, it's brutal. So, anyways, I'm going to go get this fire going. Maybe go try to maybe watch a game or something. All right, so thanks, everybody. Frida was like four pounds when I picked her up. They said she wouldn't eat and all the crap, but she's eight and a half pounds now, and she's totally nothing like what they said. I know. She seems awesome. All right, everybody. Thank you. We'll see you guys later. And... As I always say, until next time.
Be safe out there.